so yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. This is a this is a fun talk to uh, fun talk to give, and it's it started out as a bit of a side project, but now it's become a, a fairly major project for myself and my graduate students. But um, so let me uh, let me let me just start with a little bit of introduction. Um, I'm very privileged here at UC Davis to hold the Dennis G. Raveling Endowed Waterfowl Chair. So that was a uh, Dennis Raveling. Some of you may have known, but uh, many years ago he was a professor here at UC Davis and died prematurely of cancer. And he was just a giant in the waterfowl wetlands arena. And uh, so when Dennis died, there was a group of um, donors that decided they really needed to, you know, to maintain a waterfowl and wetland uh, professional professor at UC Davis here in the heart of the Central Valley. So they they endowed this chair, which and I was the first, uh, very fortunate to be the first chairholder. So I actually came down from Canada. I'm I've been here for 27 years, but you may still pick up if I say oot in a boot, uh, you'll pick up my my heritage. But uh, so bear with me. A lot of my day job is is I work in the fields of population ecology and management, wetland habitat conservation, um, particularly in the agricultural landscape. So that's you know that's sort of a lot of what my teaching and my research mission is about. But like many of you, I have an alter ego. Um, I'm a bit of a bird nerd, and more specifically, I'm a duck nut. Um, and uh, so I guess that would make me an anatophile if you're thinking about the family anatomy day. But, uh, but let me start, you know, good talks begin with a fairy tale. So let me start with a fairy tale. And I'm sure uh, when I talk about this to my students, they don't know what I'm talking about. But, but uh, I think, you know, sort of uh, many of us will recognize the story of the ugly duckling. And of course, this is a story about a duckling who are apparently a duckling that was raised and uh, and all the other ducklings on the marsh and the pond made fun of it. And it turned out it wasn't a duckling at all, but it was a beautiful swan. So the signet grew up into a beautiful swan and it had the last laugh on all the other ducklings. And, and I actually took this story to heart as a child. I thought, hey, there's hope for all of us. But I, I wonder if any of you who might have read that story to... Uh, to your children asked, uh, well, how did that swan get egg in, get into the duck nest in the first place? Um, some of you may have the answer, and it's actually a question that uh, that I sort of tracked on and off for the for the entirety of my career, as this as this talk will will illustrate. But let me let me go back to when I sort of professionally sort of first got intrigued by by a question like this, and it was the work that I did for my PhD. So these are common golden eyes. I'm sure I don't have to identify species for any of you, but I did my PhD work in British Columbia on both these guys, as well as Beryl's golden eyes, just striking birds and, and, you know, sort of black and white. I mean, they're not as colorful as some waterfowl, but I just think they're absolutely elegant. These are cavity nesting birds. So of course they require large cavities by created either by tree rod or large birds like pileated woodpeckers and, and uh, you know, so the fiend, but they'll also use nest boxes, of course, um, as do several species of cavity nesting waterfowl. So the female will lay her eggs in the nest, incubate it for 30 days or so. And then of course, uh, 24 to 48 hours after hatch, uh, the young will jump out of the nest, uh, land on the ground. And these, these nests can be 20, 30 feet above the ground. And then the female raise, or cares for them or raises them till they're about uh, two months of age. So I was, uh, when I actually just started with my master's degree. Um, and so I was hired in Northern Ontario to, to go and check golden eye boxes. So, and back in those days, we put them about 30 feet above the ground and we would climb up these trees and climbing spurs and we would ban the females. And golden eyes typically lay a clutch of, you know, seven to nine eggs, barrels golden eyes up in the interior of British Columbia. And I remember one day I came upon a nest. Uh, this was in early spring. There was still a bit of ice on the lake. And I remember sort of putting up this, uh, actually it was about a 25 foot extension ladder. It was sort of, you know, wobbly on the ground. And going up and checking this nest and lo and behold there was like 16 I think there was actually in that nest there was 20 eggs and I thought what the heck I knew most of these birds laid eight to ten eggs at most and here is this nest with 20 eggs and I, I, there's a couple of other jokers who were on the field crew with me and I thought they were playing a trick on me and I, I remember distinctly going back up the lake you know it was a it was a cold sort of spring day uh, in this this uh, what we call the Hudson Bay canoe, and uh, you know, sleet was sort of uh, going down the lake, and I was paddling uh, paddling upstream or up against the waves, and thinking, boy, you know, something's wrong here. I, I'm in trouble. And I got back to the cabin, and the other two crew members started giving me a hard time, saying, boy, you really messed up. You know, I don't know, you may not keep your job here. And I couldn't figure out what was going on with these 20 eggs in a nest. 
And then a couple of days later, I uh, found another nest and it had like 21 or 22. So I thought these guys are really getting out of hand with this joke. And then we, we kept on finding nests like that. So they hadn't done it. It was natural. And I asked, well, what's going on? And they said, oh, I don't know. It's just some females are just confused. There's, there's something going on there. I, I, females can't lay that many eggs. So they didn't really have an explanation. This was back in the, the late 1970s. So I, uh, I went back, uh, that was uh, the summer field season, went back to the campus. This is Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. And uh, I just really curious about this. And I was taking this grad course and I read this, this foundational paper by Yarm Yamtov. Um, it was published in Biological Reviews in 1980. It was about this phenomena that he called intraspecific nest parasitism. I'd never heard of it. And it certainly wasn't a very you know, hot topic at the time. Yom Tov laid it all out, all of, the, all of these ideas about what this behavior may be. And what it turns out is a form of parasitism. So not like this, where you have you know, ectoparasites or endoparasites, these are brood parasites. And of course, uh, you know, sort of anybody that knows anything about birds is well aware of cuckoos and cowbirds. Uh, these are obligate brood parasites. So this is a reed warbler with a cuckoo, European cuckoo chick. So uh, the cuckoos lay their eggs in the nest of, of other species. They never have a nest of their own. The host then actually feeds and cares for these parasitic uh, offspring. And the cuckoo chicks actually have, uh, many of you probably know well, that uh, have these instinctive behaviors of they're blind, they're naked, but they have these instinctive behaviors of rolling their backs up against uh, any other object in the nest, which turns out to be the host bird's own eggs, and, and basically summarily kicking them out. So pretty nasty, uh, pretty nasty interaction that's going on between these guys. And that's, that actually had been well studied and was just actually really getting studied particularly well. There was some, some classic older work, but it, it sort of caught fire again in the late, but at the same time, the, the sort of 1980s. But then Yom Tov sort of basically changed the perspective. So rather than those obligate brood parasites that were becoming better known, Yom Tov talked about these parasites that were conspecific. These were birds that laid their eggs in the nest of other females in the same species. So here's, uh, here's just an example. Here's a female golden eye. She's just happily you know, sitting on her eggs in the nest. And another female comes in, lays her egg in that nest, and then leaves. And you can imagine there might be quite an advantage to that parasitic female because she's now got somebody else to care for her offspring. And the host female might have some uh, additional cost because she now has a, uh, an additional young to care for. So that's this phenomenon of conspecific brood parasitism. And it got me really intrigued as a graduate student about why would females do this? Why are you laying your eggs in another female's nest? Why not just care for them yourself? So that's the last of the golden eye story, but that brings me to the wood duck. So that was, that was a little bit of work that I did back in my graduate school days. And then I came to California, was um, delighted to receive the endowed chair, uh, did most of my work on wetland conservation and waterfowl population biology. Uh, but then, then about sort of the early 2000s with a colleague, actually 2014, we, we ended up starting, got interested in, um, in sort of taking another look. And for a number of years, I had been running an internship program on this species, the wood duck. This is just a spectacular bird. And let me just quickly do a sound check. Uh, Robert, everything going okay with the sound? I, sometimes I don't know if I'm just talking to a vacuum and I've lost contact. So can you just give me a quick uh, thumbs up or thumbs down? You're quite clear. Great, super. And if folks have any questions that come up, um, put them in the chat and uh, I can see the chat. I may be zooming past it, but I'm happy to be interrupted if you, uh, if you have a question or two, or we can leave them to the end, whatever is whatever's, uh, good for you. So just gorgeous birds, the wood duck, absolutely, absolutely fantastic. Uh, you know, probably one of the most attractive birds I think in North America, at least as far as waterfowl. And, and they've been studied, I mean, since really since the 1950s or so, we know a lot about wood duck and this is Frank Belrose, who wrote this uh, just fabulous tome on the ecology and management of the wood duck, and several other colleagues, uh, Gary Hepp and, and, and Bart Kempner, have, have uh, added to that knowledge base. We know a lot about these birds. Um, we don't know a lot about them in the West as much. Most of the work has been back East. You know, they're much more common in the sort of the, the hardwood forest back East, and there's a bit of a disjunct population. So this is a, just a graph of the breeding and non-breeding. In California, they're year-round residents. And, uh, and we actually have a fairly sizable population. And we actually now know through some of our own genetic work that it's uh, genetically distinct from the Eastern population. It's not a subspecies or species level, but it but does have genetic differences compared to the Eastern populations that we've sampled. 
but the woodcock at one point at the at the turn of the century was on the verge of extinction so this is this is something that frank bellrose dug up um it was actually from 1906 the actual original comment um and this was this was the comment by cook in 1906 that forgotten is the fact that in the first decades of the 20th century it was feared that the wood duck would follow the labradoc shown here an audubon painting into extinction the labrador duck went extinct right at the turn of the century Cook wrote, so persistently has this duck, the wood duck, been pursued that in some sections it has been practically exterminated. It is constantly diminishing in numbers and is soon likely to be on known only from books or by tradition. So it was literally on the verge of disappearing from the face of the earth. What were the reasons? Uh, well, unregulated harvest and market hunting back at the turn of the century, the late 1800s, early 1900s, complete unregulated harvest. A lot of these birds, um, you, they, you know, hunters would go out with these big punk guns, they would shoot, you know, 100 birds, uh, 200 birds at a time, and they would send them off to market. Uh, and that there was no regulations, it just decimated the populations. But it's never just one thing. It was also the massive loss of these hardwood forests throughout North America. So this is this is a map, uh, it's, it's an estimation of what the hardwood forest distribution might have looked like in, in the early 1600s. And then this is what it looked like 300 years later in 1920. So, you know, we had turned a lot of these heavily forested regions into agriculture. Some of them we were sort of starting to build up larger cities. And that loss of forest really meant loss of habitat for these, uh, these birds that required, uh, required cavity nests. So the return of the wood duck, I think, is really is one of the great and one of the first original success stories in avian conservation. And a lot of that was predicated by the Migratory Bird Act. Uh, that was put in place 1916, 1918. It was ratified between the United States and Canada. Um, as this, uh, this note says, one of America's oldest and most important wildlife conservation laws. So that began to regulate some of this harvest uh, um, market hunting. Um, and that it was actually motivated in not insignificant part by the demise of the wood duck, the decline of the wood duck. The other part, of course, is, is what do we do about all of the, uh, the trees that had disappeared, particularly large enough trees that that had cavities big enough to fit a 600 gram wood duck. And Frank Bellrose, again, um, really was sort of one of the, the original sort of uh, pioneers in trying to explore ways to facilitate, if we don't have a lot of old trees, perhaps we can simulate them with nest boxes. And some of those old nest boxes were actually just basic trees that had fallen down and then were put back up on the side of another tree and they would, uh, they would have an old cavity and this would be hollow in between. Well, it turned out they didn't make even need to make them that fancy, just a plain old wooden nest box would work. So both of those, uh, and then of course, uh, in, you know, attendant with this was, was the increasing efforts to, uh, to replenish and replace some of those hardwood forests. And we've, we've seen a resurgence of, of uh, some of those forested areas throughout North America, but, but still probably not enough to completely replace what was there. Well, what about wood ducks in California? So let's turn our focus west. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a different population. They're genetically distinct from those back east. We have a disjunct population. Wood ducks, particularly in California, um, I think are birds, very different habitat. It's not the flooded hardwood forest of back east, it's the riparian forest. You think about all the rivers and streams and tributaries, you know, flowing into the Sacramento and the San Joaquin, both from the Pacific Range as well uh, as the Sierras and, and down into Southern California. And, and these riparian regions historically would have these vast riparian galleries, these, these uh, riparian forests right along the edges of all of these streams. They could be half mile, they could be a mile wide. Um, and there would be old oaks, the valley oaks. And these, these would be large enough that when they rotted or when a hole was made, would, they would just provide excellent nesting habitat, uh, tree cavities. And of course, all the, the blackberry and the, you know, the overgrowth along these, uh, these streams would provide great habitat for broods. So it's just a nirvana for wood ducks. But then, of course, we, you know, riparian systems, wetland systems as a whole, we've lost about 90% in California. I'm sure many of you know that. But we've lost the 98% of the riparian habitat. And so now most of what we have are just little vestiges, little remnants along like the Sacramento River. Um, in some cases, there's hardly any riparian along the streams. It's complete, you know, the forest is completely gone. There may be little patches left. Um, in some cases, none at all, no forests at all. We're just down to streams and effectively drainage ditches. And, uh, and even sometimes when we have riparian with issues of drought and, uh, and you know, water transfers, 
this was Puda Creek prior to the Puda Creek Accord here in next to Davis. Um, they just they dried up, so all of that habitat base was uh, was lost. So what about wood ducks? Let me just let me just uh, sort of walk you through the biology. I'm sure many of you know, but uh, but they're really just quite a spectacular bird. So just gorgeous. The males and the females are gorgeous. The females, uh, the males will court the females. You know, they get going in uh, right about this time in, in winter. Most waterfowl actually do their their pairing up in winter or very early spring. Um, then the female will uh, will lay a clutch, and her clutch is you know usually somewhere between nine and twelve, maybe nine and thirteen eggs in general. Of these, uh, no coloration, of course, in the eggs. They're just sort of a tawny brown or white or, or um, uh, off white color. The female will incubate the nest for 28 to 32 days, uh, plucking the down off her breast, and then the uh, these cute little ducklings will hatch out. And so here's a just a, a little video to to enamor you to a bunch of baby wood ducks. Hopefully you can uh, hear this. So these little guys hatch out of the eggs uh, after being incubated for about a month. And uh, they're really only in the nest for 24 to 48 hours. You know, of course they hatch out, they're downy, their eyes are open. Um, and so they will, uh, they will have this great exodus where the female will come out of the nest and she'll sit at the base of the, of the tree and she'll call the young with a very distinctive calling, sort of a cuck, 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 cuck. And the young will scramble up the inside of the cavity or the nest box and, and perch, uh, perch at the entrance for a moment or two. And then throw themselves off like little base jumpers. And it's just spectacular to see these guys. This, you know, we've watched this a number of times and people often ask, my students will ask me, gosh, you know, John, don't these, uh, don't these little guys, uh, you know, kill themselves when they lunge out of the nest and, and they very rarely get hurt. You can see them sort of, you know, spreading, you're becoming really dorsal, ventrally flattened. They spread their, their web feet like little sort of rudders and aerolons. Um, they really look like little base jumpers and, and they hit the ground and, and uh, they're just fine, even though they may be jumping from 20, 30 feet from a natural cavity. And then they regroup and follow the female and then she will, uh, she'll stay with them for, for about uh, two months, um, 50 days or so until they can, uh, they can fledge and fly. So that's the natural history. But, but getting back to the beginning of my story, so that's, that's sort of the background for, for what would be the rest of my talk. So this idea of females laying eggs in other females' nests, this brood parasitism, it turns out wood ducks are the champion. And this has been well known for quite a while. So this is a case where it's not just one female, but we get multiple females coming in, laying their eggs in a nest, so much so that if you go back into some of the, uh, uh, the more historic wildlife literature, it's not referred to as parasitism, it's referred to as dump nesting, as though females were literally dumping you know, tens of eggs into a nest. And when I say tens of eggs, I mean tens of eggs. The largest clutch that we've recorded, I think is 52 eggs. So 52, I mean, the eggs are almost spilling out of the nest box. It's just, uh, it's really quite remarkable. Um, so it really can go to some extremes. But there's a, there's a variety of other sort of really intriguing um, behaviors and aspects of the system that we're just starting to uncover. We're just sleuthing into this, this underworld. Oftentimes, we can see two females in, the, in the, the same box at the same time. We'll come up and be checking the nest. And, and they're getting along quite peacefully. And then other times, and Frank Belrose has recorded this, these females will sometimes fight almost to the death. So here are two females uh, that have putatively been killed by another female. They haven't been killed by a raptor. And I'll show you uh, some, some of this uh, um, inter, internet uh, dilemma uh, in a second. So it's just a bizarre situation. Um, so one of my graduate students, uh, um, Catherine Cook, has been looking at this with uh, these behavioral interactions with these just very simple little trail cams that we can attach uh, to the underneath the box. This is what it would look like from the duck's eye view. And I'm just going to show you two videos. Um, Robert, please let me know if you, if you can't, uh, if these don't come through. So I just want to show you the range of behaviors. In some cases, these females are vicious to one another. And in other cases, they are absolute, benign, friendly, um, totally copacetic. So this, this video is one of two females fighting over a nest box. The female who's doing all the attacking is actually the host female. She's incubating the nest. The other female who's actually quite passive and is bearing the brunt of this female's wrath is the parasite. So um, this may be for mature eyes only. No, <laughs> I won't say no animals were hurt, but no animals were killed in this video. Oh, my God. 
It's not coming through, okay? So I, 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 I won't show I won't show more of that, but did that, that, that worked out okay, great. Thank you very much for, for letting me know. So that's one example. And, and literally, there are records of females killing one another uh, for these fights. And you would think, boy, I mean, that's a pretty extreme. Animals typically don't fight to the death. They have displays. They have all sorts of ritualized behaviors so that they avoid getting hurt. So this, this seems really quite extreme. Here, here is the opposite. Here's a female on a nest. Another female comes in. She's literally sitting on her back. And the other female is completely complacent. It's like, oh dear, hi, how are you? Thanks for stopping by. Little little nibble to say hello. Um, the female that wants to lay egg, an egg is sticking her head underneath and checking to see uh, if this, uh, you know, what the state of the eggs are, and maybe she's doing a quick count. <laughs> I doubt she's counting. And stay tuned because the big reveal is about to happen. Ta -da. <laughs> it's one thing to be, you know, hanging around on my back. It's another thing to lay an egg on it. And so that's indeed what she did. A little nibble on the back. I mean, no aggression whatsoever. So it's really, you know, this, this got me intrigued. I sort of came back to this behavior uh, in about 2010 or so and kind of got interested in it. And, you know, why are these females doing this? Why do some nest, you know, um, peacefully together, others attack each other? What's, what's going on with this system? We really, I really didn't think that we had a deep understanding of what was going on. So, so um, with a number of graduate students, we've been trying to dig a little bit deeper and partly just for fun, partly because we're bird biologists, we're cur curious about their behavior, but there are also some conservation and some management, uh, some management aspects as well. So we've been asking a number of questions and I don't won't have time tonight to go over all of these, but we're looking, we're actually looking at, uh, we've used a number of genetic techniques and some other technology I'll tell you about to, to try to find out who's doing what to whom, who's, who's actually the mom of these ducklings. And, and what might they be doing and what are they getting out of it? Um, studies I won't talk about are sort of focusing on some of the cognitive aspects. You know, is this really an intentional behavior or is it a mistake or is it a competition for the nest site or are they using certain cues? And we actually have evidence that wood ducks have at least a, a crude um, capacity for, for counting, for numerosity. They do know the difference and, and they can tell the difference between nests with different numbers of eggs. Um, we've delved a little bit into the physiology. There's a whole other story. So it's literally beneath the skin, um, whether females actually might be manipulating the hormone content of their eggs and their offspring to set them down different, uh, different life history pathways. So that's a fascinating story. I'll just give you one little snapshot of that tonight to set that up. And then, and then really where this comes back into the conservation aspects is how might this behavior affect the population growth or decline, the population dynamics of this species that was on the verge of extinction. And, and from the management perspective, we've been interested in whether and how our nest box programs might impact this behavior and could influence the population dynamics. So a whole potpourri of questions that we're looking at from parentage, cognition, physiology, and population dynamics. But I'll just give you a little bit of a snapshot. But this whole study started actually 23 years ago and, and it wasn't as a scientific study, it was really designed to provide our undergraduates at UC Davis with some hands-on experience. Um, our students, we were, we're in a quarter system, so our students don't, uh, don't graduate until um, June, or they don't, they don't finish up their year until June. And in many cases, you know, you all know with birds, I mean, they're breeding in, you know, March, April, May. Um, so they would miss out on, on those, uh, on those uh, summer positions, those summer internships or jobs. So I actually started this program in, in 1998 um, to actually give our undergraduate students some hands-on skills with you know, banding and, and uh, handling eggs and nests and ducklings. Uh, and it's great because it's, it's right near campus, some of our study sites. We've had over 600 students. They get experience measuring birds, just like you know, some of you may have done with other groups of birds. Uh, we've done radio telemetry. Um, we've even got high schoolers and junior schools out there. And, and uh, so we've done this as a formal program since 2014. All the students get out of this is some internship credit and a t-shirt, which they design. And, uh, and of course it changes every year. So at one year, 2017, I think we had a hundred interns on the project. It was, uh, <laughs> it was a lot. Um, 
And then I also want to give recognition. A lot of the work that I'm talking about has been done by a, a series of graduate students. I think over a dozen graduate students and postdocs, including um, uh, Catherine Cook and David Schechter, who are working with me now, Tez Darren Mitch and, and, and Melissa, Odell, or, uh, Melissa Jones, rather, are also finishing up their degrees. And then um, this, is, this is work that I've done in collaboration with Eli Bridge at the University of Oklahoma and Bruce Line at UC Santa Cruz. So we, uh, we were fortunate to get an NSF grant to, uh, to do a, a number of these studies. And uh, just to orient you, so I'm up in here in Northern California. So here's uh, you know, Sacramento and, and the Bay Area. Um, you know, so this, we're right up in here, so this is Davis. And we have a number of different ranches around Davis. Here's Sacramento, here's Davis including uh, some up just north of the, um, the Sutter Buttes. Here's the uh, Sutter Buttes, the world's, um, or not the world's, but California's oldest <laughs> and smallest uh, mountain range and volcano. So who's doing what and to whom? So let's launch a little bit in. I'll try not to use too much jargon and I'll try to keep the number of sort of scientific slides down to a minimum, but uh, there are a few that I'll need to show and I'll, I'll make sure I walk you through them as best I can. Please, uh, please stop me if you don't understand something or if I'm moving too fast. Um, one of the first things we did was use these new tools in population genetics. Uh, you, I'm sure you've all heard about this. I mean, just there's, there's just been an explosion of, of genetic techniques where we can sequence whole genomes now. Um, we've used a number of different uh, techniques, doesn't matter what they are, but we're now, we're now looking at over 2,500 target regions in the DNA um, and that allows us to really get a very fine scale view of, of who's related to who, who the mother and fathers are, um, whether ducklings are sisters or brothers and sisters, aunts, uncles. So we can really get a very, very deep uh, pedigree for all of these females. And we can really get some idea of, of the parentage. And, and that's just from a little snippet of blood from the females in the, the, the mediotarsal vein. And likewise, for the ducklings, you really don't need very much. This is all using DNA sequencing techniques. It's, it's just remarkable, um, the capabilities we have now of really diving deep into the genetic basis and, and uh, the, the genetic structure of populations. So I, I won't go into more details on that and I'll just kind of give you the takeout. So we did this and we've done this now for, oh gosh, you know, as I said, uh, 600 females, uh, probably three or 4,000 ducklings to this point, more to come. And here's what we found. I'll just say this in words. 42% of all the nests that we've studied since 2014 have more than a single mom. So 42% of them are parasitized, almost half. 17% of the young, if you just look at all the young that hatch out of the population, almost a fifth of them were incubated and raised in a nest that wasn't their, their genetic biological mother. And, and that can go from some nests, that's none, but that can be as many as 70% in some nests. So 70% of the kids, the offspring that a female is caring for are not her own in that nest. That's a pretty high number. And uh, the number of females that can lay eggs parasitically, I think this number is actually going to go up, but it's, it's at least up to five different females may be laying and successfully hatching out or having hatched out ducklings uh, from the same nest. So it really is quite a, quite a shell game. There's, you know, this, this, I, I'm calling it parasitism right now. It's quite wide, widespread, multiple females laying in a single nest. Many young are raised by females other than their genetic mother. So, so we're getting a very different view of sort of our classic understanding of, you know, one mom, one father, um, one, one family, you know, sort of in a, in a bird nest. But here's, here's, so the genetics for sure has, has really changed our view of a lot of things. Uh, here's the other technology, and this is thanks to Eli using pit tags to really uncover the underworld. So pit tags are just these little passive integrated transponders doesn't have a battery, there's no power, it's just basically a coated wire. Um, and it's really quite small, smaller than a dime. And, and you can, you can you know, implant these in all sorts of uh, animals or, or attach them to animals. But then what you need is some sort of device and it's called a radio frequency identification device or an RFID. And you need some sort of device that actually is the power source that queries these tags. It sends a bolt of energy, queries these tags the tags and simply send back a binary code and then the reader records it. And they've used this a lot to tag salmon fingerlings, for example, uh, prior to going out to sea. And then they have these massive readers, very expensive, very powerful on the streams. And when the salmon come back, they can tell 
if they'd hatched out from that hatchery or from whatever. Well, we've now co-opted this technique. Here's, you can see the little small little pit tag. Um, I, I don't know if you can see my arrow in this. I hope you can see my arrow. Um, you can see here's just a pit tag on the size of a dime. Uh, so we can inject this and in just subcutaneously, just in the backs of the female. Um, they don't even notice. I, don't, I just don't think there's many nerves in the back of the female. I guess there would be no reason to really. Um, likewise, in the ducklings, we can, we can inject them in the ducklings. And we've done this to hundreds. We, had, you know, we did all the proper uh, prior protocols. We do a little um, anesthetic on it. We put some, um, uh, uh, we anesthetize it and, and, uh, and then you know, um, a little bit of surgical glue. It's just a small little hole. And so then they're all, they're all tagged. It's the same thing as vets do with your, with your dogs, with a, with a chip. Um, thanks, Caddy, for letting me know about the arrow. And, and then what we have is on each of these boxes, uh, on every one of our boxes, here's the an antenna. We have a battery. And inside this little case here is this RFID. So these are the things that used to cost about $2,000 a piece. Just could not afford them. Eli at the University of Oklahoma has now made them for about $30 a piece. And what happens is when a female or a duckling goes through this antenna, the RFID queries, it's powered by the battery, sends out a signal, sends out basically a, um, a query, if you will, an electronic query. The tag sends back its, its unique binary code, and then that gets stored on a little SD card. And so we have every reading of every female, and they're uniquely tagged. So here's just a picture of a female coming off. You know, the pit tag would be right here, and the and the antenna is picking up her, her code and sending it back. So it's just like the barcode reader at the grocery store, effectively. And the female or ducklings could be moving very quickly over this antenna and you pick up their tag, you pick up their ID. So you can, you can get all of this information without ever even seeing a female. So we now have these tags in over 600 adult females and over 5,000 ducklings. We put one in every duckling at hatch. And, and the trick was we were able to put these readers on every single nest box. We have 197 on four different study sites. And we're upwards of about over, I think we're actually almost after, uh, after this year, we'll be over 2 million reads. So there's a lot of information to go through. Let me show you what we've discovered. So on the left, each one of these points is a nest box. This little yellow is going to be the female and you're going to see her pathway. And this is the entire breeding. You'll sort of see down here that it'll scan along the bottom. And this is actually the entire breeding season from April to, uh, to May, actually in this case till June. And here's another female and she's starting out on this box. So I'm gonna contrast two females. So I'll just let you watch. So this female on the left, all of these boxes are the ones that she's visiting. The little yellow pathway is her, sort of, is her, uh, her highway back and forth. The bigger and the more red it becomes, the more visits she's made to that box and contrast that with this other female. So this, fe I mean, this female is just, I mean, it's almost like she's, you know, on speed or something. <laughs> she's just all over the place. You can see there's four boxes that she really likes. Um, this female was a single box the entire season, never went anywhere else. And it was this kind of variation that just astounded us. So here's, here's just the pathway of that first female. You can see all of the, uh, all of the different nest boxes that she visited. And this is a stretch of, uh, well, there's, there's uh, this is about a hundred feet here. So, you know, this would be, oh, I don't know what this would be, maybe a kilometer or something like that uh, in length along, this is Conway Ranch, just this little riparian strip. Uh, it's just phenomenal. And this one female is actually, so she was actually a, a young female, a first year female. We tagged her as a duckling the year before in 2014. In 2015, the year that I showed you, she actually visited 34 different nest boxes, 195 visits, including 30 to her favorite one. And she laid 12 eggs. So from the genetics now, we can actually go and do the maternity analysis. We had a blood sample from her. We had a blood sample from all the ducklings in all of these nests. And we found out that she actually had laid eggs in four different nests. And they were all in a row and they're just a bit down from where she had hashed out the year before. And so she actually successfully had a you know, 12 ducklings produced, but she never incubated one of them. Uh, she never had a nest of her own. She returned the next year. She was now on 42 boxes, again, laid eggs parasitically. So this is a female that was basically trap lining her entire career. Um, just to show you, is that just a, an anomalous female? Here's another site. This is Roosevelt Ranch. Um, this is up by Zamora. 
big, lovely uh, restored wetland. We've got boxes all over the place. And, and what I'm going to show you here, I'll just start. Each one of these different colors is a different tagged female. And the color of the lines represent their pathway as they're going from day to day from one nest box to the next. And you can just kind of see it's it's almost it's like a spider web and this is throughout the entire season eventually they stop laying and they go off stream but if you if you summarize all that this is what it looks like it's just absolutely remarkable so there are some females that are roving all over the place going to many many boxes and it's a little bit harder to see you lose them but there are some females that just stay in a box by themselves this brown female went to two for example so a big variation in this behavior Okay, so here's one of the scientific graphs that I have to show you. Um, bear with me. So what I'm showing you here, this is on the on this axis down here. These are the individual pit tag numbers. It's basically like a band number. So each one of these little bars is an individual female. And what I'm showing you here is on the on this axis, the vertical axis, is the number of boxes that that any individual female was recorded in during a breeding year. I think this was 2017. So she was in five boxes, 10 boxes, 15, et cetera. The red bars that I'm showing you can almost not even see them are the number of times we caught each of these females. These are, this is the typical way we would monitor these populations. We would wait till the females in about the second or third week of incubation, carefully go up to the box, close the hole, gently take her out, measure, measure her, put a band on her if she's not banded or record her band number if she is, put her back in and they're just fine. And typically, a lot of these females, we would obviously only catch in one box. Sometimes we caught them in two. A number of these females, we never caught at all. So that's the classic way that we would census these populations and the classic way that we would, we would say what females are on what nests. Now let's look at for those same females using these RFID reads that we get, these pit tag reads. Oops, I'm sorry. This is what you get. So the blue bars now represent the number of nests. I'll just choose this female. She's our champion. This female was on 51 different nests, um, even though we never caught her. We never caught her. We wouldn't have known that she was alive and in the population. So she was a duckling that came back, and, uh, and she was out heavily visiting all of these different nest sites, and, uh, and it was just phenomenal. And, and it's really quite remarkable. I mean, even just from a conservation perspective, it's changing our viewpoint on what actually constitutes a population. Here's a group of females that clearly were alive. They were probably laying eggs. In fact, the genetics tell us that they were, and yet we would never have caught them. We would not have known they were in the population. And you know, here's, a, here's our champion, again, this female. Never caught her and she was on 50 different nests. So we're getting a very different viewpoint of what actually constitutes survival and recruitment using this technology. Um, and so that's just amazed us. And here's just a comparison. Using, using the sort of the standard techniques capturing on the nest, we would have had about 57 that we captured. We also had the RFIDs for them because they, they were all tagged. Um, some didn't have RFID tags yet, so that's another 3%. So that's about 60%. Almost 40% of the females in this one particular year were not recorded by, by capture. They were recorded only by this automated uh, RFID system and only because we tagged them as ducklings. So that's, I mean, it's really changing our perspective on, on who's out there. But what gets interesting is some of the behavioral variation we see. So here's another scientific graph. Sorry, I don't mean to, to overwhelm you with, you know, with jargon and stuff, but, but this uh, on the horizontal axis here, it's, it's just a distribution of the number of different boxes um, uh, females were recorded on. So here's that female, that one female, she was recorded on 51. And this just tells you the number of females. So six females were recorded on one box. Um, another, uh, whatever, 22 females were recorded on two boxes, et cetera. And what you can see is there's a group of females that were typically on maybe two to four or five boxes. And then there's this other group of females that are all over the place. They're going to 30, 40 boxes within a year. So we're seeing a lot of variation in this visiting behavior. Um, and then this other red uh, plot here just shows if you just randomly took all of these females, threw them into the existing boxes, like you know, balls into a bucket. Well, just by chance alone, you would get, you know, some that you know, multiple balls in one bucket, some in none 
many, you know, et cetera. You would sort of get a, a random distribution. So this is just if it was random. It's clearly not random. You've got females that are visiting fewer boxes than you'd expect by chance, and some that, um, that are a lot more. So uh, it's just really quite, quite remarkable. There's quite, quite uh, a difference. Here's what we're learning about this parasitic behavior. So some of these females that are actually incubating nests are actually laying eggs in the nest of other females as well. And that turns out to be almost uh, you know, over a third of the females. So they're nesting on their own, but they're also laying some eggs parasitically. So it looks like we actually have three types of females. We have these females that are only parasitic. So in a single breeding season, they're laying an egg in a nest and they never incubate a nest of their own. Then what we have are the sort of the typical, you know, um, stay-at-home females. So these are what we would normally think of a nesting bird. So a female has a nest and incubates her own nest. And then we have these females that do both. They lay some eggs parasitically, and then they come back and incubate a nest of their own. So we see this big variation that we were thinking this was mostly what females did. Maybe a few did this. And it turns out that these three different types of reproducing, of nesting, are about equally common about 30% to 37% nest only, 23 are only laying eggs parasitically, and 39% are, are doing both. Um, when we actually look at how well they're doing, we follow these females now over their lifetime. What we see is that, and this is a, this is a bit of a, um, a bit more of a sort of structure graph, but if you just look at this horizontal line here, that's like the, that's the median, that's kind of like the average, the midpoint. And these are the number of ducklings produced by females that are only parasites that only have a nest of their own or these females that are doing both. And you can see that, you know, these females average about 6.4 ducklings over their lifetime. These females average 8.7 and these females average 14.4. So that you can really see there's this gradation from getting something, getting more, the kind of standard approach and really getting the bonus, getting the jackpot. And I just want to point out some of these points out there. Some of these females are producing 60, 50, 55 ducklings in their life pen. So these are the super producers out there. So there seems to be this pattern in how well females do, depending on what they do. So this is kind of the story, story to hear, um, what we've learned from both the genetics and the RFID. And it looks like we have three different types of females. They're not necessarily fixed into doing one versus another. It looks like, uh, it looks like these females are changing these behaviors over their lifetime. And it appears that it's mostly younger females they, uh, in poor condition or when nest sites are limited or maybe when they're just inexperienced. Those are the ones that seem to be laying eggs parasitically. They're doing sort of a low cost entry into the game of reproduction, but they're not having to incubate. There's lots of risks. They're using energy when they incubate. There's a risk of uh, getting killed by a predator. So that's kind of a low entry into the world of reproduction. And then, you know, what we think about is the quote unquote normal or typical. So that's a female, she's in good condition, she can get a nest site, maybe she's experienced enough. It's kind of the status quo. And that's what we thought most birds were doing. That's our usual story. And then we have these females that are doing both. And it seems that these are our older females, the females that are in really good condition. Um, what they seem to be able to do is they're almost squeaking out two broods a year, but they're only having to incubate one. They'll lay almost equivalent of a clutch of eggs in other birds' nests. And then they'll lay a second clutch, sometimes after a break, and incubate that themselves. Um, so they're almost double nesting. And they're getting this extra reproduction, this enhancement. And, and what our current thoughts are now is all three of these strategies allow birds to kind of adjust their reproductive investment, depending on their own conditions, their age, their experience, their resources. Um, and so it provides a, really a very flexible life history to cope with a lot of uncertainty. But it's not so simple. It turns out in waterfowl, as I'm sure many of you know, it's the females, unlike passerines, for example, it's the females that are philopatric, natally philopatric. It's the females that return to where they were hatched, where they were born, if you want, but where they were hatched. They return to their natal site um, as adults to breed. So that means you've got females who were born in the same area. They could be relatives. These Host and so-called parasites may, in fact, be relatives rather than um, competitors. So maybe it's not parasitism at all. Maybe it's a form of cooperation or family daycare. You know, it's about communal living and it's about you know peace, music, and love. Woodstock. You know, 
and maybe it's that some of these females are related, like those two that were very gentle and kind to each other, and maybe the other ones are not. And so those are the ones that are much more aggressive to one another. We're just starting to discover that. Perhaps that explains these, uh, these differential interactions among females. So using our RFIDs, we're now starting to tear into the wood duck social network, just like, just like Facebook and everything that you know, we've talked about, about you know, seven degrees of separation and how few people are really key individuals connected to everybody else. And some people are loners and so forth. Wood ducks are waterfowl or a highly social group. When they are looking for nest boxes early in the year, they'll often prospect in groups. You'll see multiple females, the female will be with a male, the male's often sort of standing on guard. Sometimes even the males will go into the box, but they'll be inspecting these boxes together. You see these little cliques or these little cohorts. So using our, RF, our, our RFID data, our pit tag data, we were able to start piecing together some of these social networks of females that are visiting nest boxes and potentially laying eggs in those nest boxes together. And so here's just a very small one. This, this is actually what it looks like. And it's, it's, a, it's an analysis that people use you know, in all the social networking kinds of you know, Facebook, Google, et cetera. Um, it's become very sophisticated in the psychological field and it's now been applied in, in the conservation and ecological sciences. So here's one group of females and that's just colored here. This is a graphic that Holly Heiser nicely put together for us for an article. So these fans, these hens are all tightly coupled. They're all interacting. They're all hanging out together. This is, these are the cool kids. And then there's a group of uh, sort of hens that are somewhat connected, somewhat social, but they're not part of the main sort of inner clique. And then here are the ones who are probably like me as a high schooler, you know, they're just not very social at all. They're hanging around the outside. They're going out bird watching or something. Um, so this is a real network, uh, and, it, and it struck me when we drew this, here was one I actually just pulled off the web, and it, it struck me how similar it was, almost verbatim, to, uh, to the one that we had for, uh, for our birds. Here, here's a much more complicated one. This is at a higher density. So again, each one of these blue points is an individual female, and the lines connect females that are visiting nests together. So you know, the closer they are, the more frequently they are occurring together or visiting nests or laying eggs in the same nest. The more distant they are, the more uh, the less likely they are to co-occur together or to visit nest together. And so the females with many connections are part of these sort of core social groups. And then these other females are ones that are non-social explorers. So it's really, uh, it's really, you know, we're finding quite a bit of structure in these populations. It's just, uh, it's just really, really quite, quite remarkable. So then it comes back to this question of, okay, are these friends or, or enemies? Here's that network that I showed you. This is just one, one, one population where we've done this analysis. We've also done the genetics on this population. So we can blow up or pull apart this network by groups of relatives. So that's what I'm gonna do here. So I'm now pulling apart from that network, groups of individuals that we know are closely related, at least to the level of, of cousins. And you can see that this network is actually comprised of a whole series of sub networks of uh, potentially closer related individuals, but then some that are not. So we really have a mix of both friends and family, but also possibly enemies. And we're just starting to get, you know, sort of deeper into who hangs out with who, what is it that forms these relationships. It's a much more complicated, complex social network than we'd anticipated. And it's a lot more like people, a lot more like humans. Just very quickly on the physiology side, and then I want to finish off with a, with a bit of a conservation story. Um, one of my PhD students, Nicole Odell, working with Hubert Schwab and Letty Reichardt, was, um, we got interested in, in hormones and eggs. And, and there's a, there was work done about a decade, 15 years ago, led by Hubert Schwab, that showed that females often deposit steroids, like androstenedione and testosterone, into the yolks of their eggs. And that can actually facilitate rapid sort of growth of the embryo. Um, so we were wondering if there was differences in these parasitic versus non-parasitic females, particularly if females, these parasitic females could, uh, if they doped their eggs, if they put more of these hormones in to more rapidly cause the development of their offspring, perhaps that would give them an advantage uh, in being able to hatch out from these, uh, from these nests that they parasitize and perhaps even have more viable offspring. Um, there's a lot more to do here, but I'll just show you. This is this is uh, A4 and standard, you know, just a precursor to testosterone. And indeed, those parasitic eggs did have higher levels 
of, of uh, testosterone, of steroids than the host egg. So there clearly is some hormonal differences. Now, whether this is a strategy or whether this just is a consequence of the females that are parasitic tend to have more testosterone, we don't know, but there's a hormonal signal that seems to be particular uh, percolating through the system. So we don't know if we have like, you know, super ducks and super ducklings uh, that are being produced in this population, but that's, that's another area to explore. So let me, let me finish up on the last part and it comes back to kind of the conservation implications. One of the reasons I also started the, um, the internship project is uh, we were working with California Waterfowl Association. They have a great wood duck program. Um, we've worked with Ducks Unlimited. We've worked with a number of private landowners. It's really a great opportunity. And, and there's an interesting phenomenon that happens. This is a, the Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge. It's an older study. But when you put up these nest boxes, what happens is the population often takes off, starts off slow. The blue here is just the total numbers of eggs laid on this National Wildlife Refuge. Takes off just as reaches astronomical numbers. Some of you who may have wood duck uh, projects may see the same thing. And then it kind of plummets and it levels out. And the same thing if you look at the total number of ducklings produced, they're all taking off, taking off, taking off, and then they kind of crash and level out. And so people have wondered, you know, why does this happen? And so a number of years ago, um, Brad Semmel and Paul Sherman published some papers that said, you know what? This is our fault. What we're doing is we're putting out these really high and unnatural densities of boxes, duplexes, you know, tons of boxes in a row, highly visible. And they said, what it's doing is it's actually exacerbating this brood parasitic behavior. Now, instead of having these, these nest sites sort of hidden back in the woods, lower densities, not harder to find, now they're super easy to find and you're really exacerbating this parasitism. You're getting these big clutch sizes and that's actually ending up having a negative effect because many of those large clutches don't hatch. So here's just a schematic. Here's a natural cavity, you know, much harder to see. And the idea that these cavities would be away from the water, they'd be kind of spread out. And if you look at sort of estimates of densities of cavities large enough for wood duck, they would be, you know, less than one cavity per hectare. Some of these nest box programs are super dense like this one here. Um, and you can look at some and they could be up to two to five boxes per hectare. So we're creating a really unnatural high density situation, according to Samuel and Sherman. When you get these high densities, that's when you get these really big clutches, you know, that the wildlifers used to call dump nests. And when that happens, a lot of these eggs don't, they, they, they fail to be incubated or they start to rot, or in some cases, the nest is just abandoned. You see this nest was incubated, there was down, but look at all the rotten eggs that are in here. They're just non-viable. And in fact, we've looked at this over the years. This is just a graph showing the proportion of eggs that hatch from zero to 100% as a function of the number of eggs in the nest. And once you get beyond about 30 eggs, it just drops to zero. It's almost like there's an upper limit um, to which uh, you know, uh, females can incubate eggs or will stay behind and incubate. And it, and it starts to drop off after about 30 eggs. So there's an upper limit. So one of the things we did with the internship project was just to experimentally manage our populations to see if adding too many nest boxes or not enough nest boxes made a difference. So we had a couple of sites where we had very low densities. We tried to put them back in the trees, you know, um, about four boxes per kilometer. And then we had some sites that had really high densities, um, boxes that were much closer together. And then we, uh, and now actually we've been able to use our RFID network to actually see, are we getting just a lot more social interference in these high density areas? So here along this axis here, horizontally, each one of these bars is a different nest box. And this is Conway Ranch in the blue. This is uh, Roosevelt Ranch where you have both high density and low density sites by experimental design. And I'm showing you here Russell Ranch in the green on the far right. These are boxes that are very low density and very hidden. And again, the bars represent the number of different birds, number of individually different birds, different wood ducks that are visiting these sites. And you can see the high density just getting a lot more birds. Roosevelt depends on whether it's high and low, and then Russell is low. So for sure, um, we are exacerbating at least the number of nest visits and this parasitic egg laying under these high density situations. So, so one, last, one last series of graphs, so bear with me on this. I'll explain this. This is a graph of the basically the frequency of parasitism, the proportion of eggs um, averaged in each nest that were parasitic, that were not belonging to the host female. And here's our low 
density population shown below in blue. And we've tracked that over a number of years. And here's our high density. And indeed, in the high density populations, you do indeed get more eggs laid parasitically. There's interesting dip here. But overall, as Semelin Sherman suggested, you actually exacerbate this behavior. How does that affect reproductive success? So here are the proportion of eggs that are hatching from zero to 100%. Again, the same span of years. And as Semelin Sherman indicated, under the low density situations in most years, hatch success is much higher, 80%, 70%. Under the high density situations, fewer eggs are actually hatching out. It can actually drop down to almost 10%. So it looks like the high density and low density do indeed differ in terms of the frequency of this behavior, parasitism, and the success, success of those eggs in the nest. But if you just look at total production, the total number of ducklings produced under those high density versus low density uh, experimental um, management scenarios, you're actually producing more ducklings because there's just more eggs being laid. So even though that not as many or not a lower proportion hatch, the absolute number of them is still higher. So if you're just involved or concerned with producing more ducklings, which hopefully come back as adults, you still do better under high density than a low density. So this has kind of created a bit of a manager's dilemma. You know, The low density, you have less of this behavior, higher hatch success, but you actually have fewer nests and fewer eggs laid and lower total production. But this might be sort of something that some people would feel is a bit more of a natural, normal situation, emulates a natural situation. The high density situation is the opposite, a lot more parasitism, lower hatch success, but more eggs and more nests and greater total production. So, so what to do, and I think this is the last sort of data slide I'll show you, really our concern is not just about average success, it, it's what, how our arrangement of nest boxes might influence the population dynamics. And here's just a simple schematic. So the idea is under high density, you get frequent parasitism that causes lower hatch success and lower reproductive success. That could cause lower density over time, just fewer birds coming back. Maybe under lower density, parasitism goes down. So you get higher success that builds up the density. So you could get cycles or chaotic population behavior or just greater variability. And in fact, if you look at these high density sites, this is the frequency of parasitism. You can see it's a lot, it fluctuates much more so this behavior under the high density, kind of like we sort of are hypothesizing here versus a low density. So it's just, it's just to indicate that this behavior could indeed have impacts on a population level and our management actions could impact that. So just summing up, here's all the different kind of things we're working on. I could just tell you a little bit about the parentage today and the population dynamics, not much on the cognition and, and physiology. But I just want to leave you with this message that, you know, there really, there's this whole underworld, the social sneaky behaviors, this brute parasitism, it's a lot more complex than we thought. Um, lots of things we don't know about the mechanisms, differences among females, the extent to which these relatedness networks or social networks play a role in who does what to who, whether females are physiologically manipulating um, the offspring, their offspring, the phenotype or the development rates of their offspring. And, and then also really trying to look more closely at the impact of these, uh, these behaviors and our management on population dynamics. So there are duck secrets out there that, uh, that sometimes surprise us and it's not always what it appears to be, you know, and, and you just, you know, you look a little bit below the surface and uh, I've been absolutely astounded with what we're learning about wood ducks and, and it's a far more complex system than I could ever imagine. So there's secrets that amaze and impress and astound us and we don't have to look any further than our own backyards. So uh, it's been a really fun sort of venture. Um, unfortunately, I'm getting close to retirement, so I'm not sure. Hopefully I'll have a younger colleague that will want to come along and, uh, and carry the study on. Um, if any of you are interested as well, the Ducks Unlimited has a, has a series of podcasts and uh, we did too, where I talked about uh, this brood parasitism in birds in general, and then, and then particularly our study on wood ducks. So if you're interested in listening more, about that, you can find them on the Ducks, uh, Ducks Unlimited podcast. So just thanks to my colleagues, Bruce Lyon and Eli Bridge, a whole cadre of just fantastic graduate students and a, and a huge number of undergraduates who've devoted their time. And then of course, a number of funding sources. So thanks very much for listening to me and um, I will end and stop sharing my screen and uh, be happy to take any questions. And it looks like there are some uh, 
some questions that are in here. So I can go through those or, or uh, Robert, I can let you be the MC and, and uh, direct this as you see, uh, as you see fit. Well, I just scroll through. I'd like to start by uh, reading to everybody the, the message from Bill Ralph, who's from Yosemite area Audubon. He's local to us here. And he says, if you're interested in helping me monitor wood duck boxes, contact me. These boxes are below Snelling in Merced County. There are also a few that successfully use uh, barn owl nests. And his email is in the chat. It's bill at dryadranch.com. So if anybody's interested. Also, just a reminder that this video will be uh, posted on our YouTube channel tomorrow. So if you missed any of it, or if you uh, want to get some of those uh, links that were shown earlier on the podcast, you'll be able to look them up there. Um, Nancy Gilmore would like to point out that there are a lot of places locally to see wood ducks. A couple of the good ones are uh, Chaffee Zoo, um, Roding Park. There's an area there where there's a lot of wood ducks and also in Woodward Park. So if you'd like to see some. Uh, Ron Martin had asked what, what the male ducks are called. Uh, Susan Eastep suggested drakes, but I guess we just like to confirm that. <laughs> that's true. The males are drakes. Is that right? Yes, that's absolutely okay. right. Yeah. These are all colloquial terms, but yes, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so how does yearly temperature and rainfall fit into number of eggs laid and number of fledged? That's from a question from Bill Ralph. Yeah, Bill, that's a great question. And Bill, I think I think uh, you contacted me and I think I, I owe you a, a contact back if you're if you're still on about some of the work that you're doing. I'd, I'd very much like to uh, to talk <laughs> with you. Um, so yeah, there's um, we're actually really just starting to discover that now the, the last couple of years, both with the drought that we've had, as well as the, uh, the temperature, uh, rainfall for sure, uh, certainly is, is affecting the timing, the phenology, um, you know, in dry years or just nesting later. And, and I think part of that has to do with just the availability of invertebrates. Wood ducks switch on to much more of invertebrate diet just prior to laying to get the proteins they need to make eggs. So the availability of invertebrates, I think, is really important. Um, and, but the temperature is really becoming quite a conundrum. We're finding that, that the sort of the, the later nesting females are being very, very unsuccessful because their eggs are literally getting cooked in the nest. We've had ducklings pipping in the egg, almost ready to hatch, and then they die. I mean, it's just devastating. Um, and uh, the early nesting females are doing okay. It's the later nesting females with the hot spells. That's happened more frequently over the past several years. And interesting, we also have hooded mergansers now starting to show up in the uh, in some of our populations. Um, hooded mergansers nest earlier, so they're not getting hit the same way. They're actually most of the most of their nests are hatching out successfully before the sort of later June July heat waves happen. And so, what we may be seeing actually, hooded mergansers are becoming more common. They're sort of moving south in the valley. With these, these climate change, we may be seeing sort of a bit of a replacement where hooded mergansers as earlier nesters are becoming a little bit more common. That's also true up at Gray Lodge, whereas, uh, whereas wood ducks are really sort of starting to get hit on the tail end of the season, and perhaps it's going to cause a constriction in the range. So, you know, climate change, um, uh, the drought situation, we're just, uh, it, you know, it's a really interesting situation. We've got 20 some odd years of data now, and you almost need those long-term data sets to follow this. So um, for absolutely, yeah, temperature and rainfall are definitely impacting not just number of eggs and number of young fledged, but overall nest success as a whole, the whole nest can be wiped out. Mm -hmm. So that's a great question, Bill, yeah. Uh, Lampa asks, has this kind of behavior in egg laying been seen in other ducks that are nap cavity nesters in, that use boxes? Absolutely. Uh, use boxes and even in natural cavities. Um, so almost every cavity nesting species of ducks, bufflehead, common uh, in barrels, golden eye, hooded mergansers, um, common mergansers. It's a actually even been found in red-breasted mergansers uh, quite frequently, which nest, uh, on, they nest on the ground. Um, so it's actually, you know, it, it probably occurs in about 50 or 60% of waterfowl to some extent. Redheads and canvasbacks, ruddy ducks are notorious for it. Even mallards will do it. It's more common in high density situations for some of the dabbling ducks, but it's, it's quite frequent in almost all of the cavity nesting waterfowl and some of the emergent nesting poachers, for example, canvasbacks, redheads, scop um, as well. Yeah, ducks just, I don't know, ducks are weird as my students <laughs> might tell you. <laughs> they, they, do some, uh, they do some strange things. 
And we have here a direct message to me. It says the Cal Department of Fish and Wildlife, this is from Ron Martin. Uh, Cal Department of Fish and Wildlife sets bag limits on various duck species hunted. I wonder if the limit of wood ducks has been increased or decreased. Do you know have any knowledge? Uh, yeah, hasn't hasn't changed. Uh, you can shoot seven wood ducks. Um, so uh, wood duck is it's interesting. Back east, wood ducks are the number two or three bird in the bag, um, but that's also because most of the hunting areas are are where wood ducks occur. In California, wood ducks are mostly in the riparian regions where most people don't hunt. So most of the hunting is in managed wetlands or rice fields. So there's not very many wood ducks that are are hunted. Um, so they're not, uh, you know, they're they're good table bird, etc. There's nothing the nothing that people don't like. But you just don't most of the places that people hunt in California, you're not likely unless you're specifically in a riparian area, you're not likely to encounter many wood ducks. So the bag limits, the bag limits out here in California probably have not impacted them at all. Well, that's all the questions we have in the chat. I had a question yeah. for you about uh, what role the males are playing in this, if any. You said mm -hmm. earlier they guard the boxes or the nests. Um, do they ever drive off some of these parasitic? Yeah, that's I, that's a great question, Robert. We we yeah. actually don't know. I mean, you know, we know that the males will attend the female. I think what they're doing is they're guarding their mate. One of the things our genetics has shown is the males are up to hanky panky as well. Um, so males will mate with multiple females. Mm -hmm. Females will actually mate with multiple males. So this is a very promiscuous reproductive system in wood ducks. Um, the extent to which males are actually guarding the female and protecting her, or just guarding his own self interest, trying to keep other males away, um, we really don't know. Most we've done some blind observations. Wood ducks, as you probably know, are pretty secretive. They're they're pretty skittish. Um, we've done some hideouts and blinds to try to watch them. Um, and you'll see them. You'll see them on top of the boxes while the females are prospecting and they'll fly around with the female. Um, but by and large, once a female starts laying eggs, they're they're gone. They they're sort of leaving everything else to the female. So I I don't think the males, this is really a system that's very female um, um, managed, uh, you know, female focused. It's the females that are really in the driver's seat with wood ducks, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, we have no more questions, so I'd like to thank you for uh, presenting thank to us tonight. It was a fascinating talk, and I really appreciate it. You're an excellent speaker, and we'll have oh, to thanks. have you back some other time. <laughs> I wish I could do this in person, but as you said, uh, maybe we reach more people on Zoom. Um, <laughs> if you could send me the Zoom link, that would be great, because I could provide that to, to some, of my, uh, some of my students. We, we run this big internship project, and so I'll be starting that up next week. And uh, so I can just actually have them watch the video instead of uh, instead of me having <laughs> to go. do it all over again, well, if you don't you mind. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, thanks, everybody. And I hope you, uh, you know, I hope you get a chance to see some wood ducks and enjoy them. They're really it's uh, quite a bit more remarkable things that they do than we, we would have anticipated. So thank you very much for, for listening. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Good night. And I uh, will hope to see you out on a field trip soon. We are starting our field trips back up. Uh, we're doing a couple, one tomorrow, but I think it's full. And then there's another on the 19th. And then in uh, March, we will have a two, at least two and hopefully more. So thank you all for your patience during COVID. And uh, we look forward to seeing you out in the field too. Take care, everyone. Good night. Bye, everybody. Stay well. Thanks, Robert. Thank you.